and thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Uh, we're going to start the webinar just immediately. Um, Professor Jenin, thank you very much for joining. We can see you. Um, Joshua, okay, okay, thank you very much for joining. And to everyone okay. participating, thank, thank you very much. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to CIMC 2021. My name is Sephora, but I need the honor to be hosting this beautiful event. Well, for most of you have questions about where I work, yes, I work in the ITDU of PGD Team Foundation. And as I said, uh, most of you too might have questions about what GIS, that is geographic. Information that it's all about. Well, you will soon be on the road to understanding what the IS is. Today, I will not be going to the event alone. I am going to the event with Chukudi Mujawa, who is the capacity building coordinator of the foundation. Chukudi, over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Deborah. Okay, so to kick that, uh, I want to once again welcome all the participants to this team speed reading GIS 2021 webinar. And uh, because GIS is useful in providing solutions to several social, economic, and environmental problems, we're happy to know that we have a wide range of participants uh, attending today's event uh, from different fields and sectors <coughs> and from different parts of the world. Our event today focuses on GIS applications for enhancing peace building. So the theme of today's event, enhancing peace building through GIS. Uh, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers, experienced uh, fellows in the field of uh, GIS and spatial technology, especially in its application in peace building, conflict, and in uh, social and economic development. And they will be telling us about how they use Special principles and technology to support development, either through research, which leads to findings that support decision making, or through GIS informed actions implemented in local communities. Today's GIS celebration is organized by the Foundation for Partnership Initiatives in the Niger Delta, that is FIND. Uh, FIND is a Nigerian non profit foundation established to support the social and economic development of Nigeria's Niger Delta. We have an overarching goal of creating a peaceful environment that enables business to thrive and thus increase income and employment in the region. We do this majorly through two distinct but interrelated programs, program areas. That is the economic development program, which is focused on generating opportunities for pro poor market development and employment generation as well as the peace building program, which is hosting to this event. Uh, and the aim of the peace building program is to strengthen conflict resolution mechanism for enabling integrated peace and economic growth in the region. Now we are going to um, call, we're going to call on the uh, manager of the peace building program, Dr. David, to uh, welcome you all to this event and officially start the GIS Day 2021. Thank you very much. Dr. David, Dr. David, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chukudi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on your location based on time difference. Uh, welcome to GIS Day 
2021 events. And I want to thank everyone for uh, the decision to participate in these uh, events today, despite uh, other schedules. Uh, Tribuli has talked briefly about uh, what the Foundation for Partnership Initiative is the host of this program. But it's good for us to have the understanding that uh, Foundation for Partnership Initiative in the Marriage and Delta is all seeing these events because of our understanding the role of special technology in contemporary economic and peace building intervention. And our theme is uh, enhancing peace building through GIS. Uh, PIM is a Nigerian nonprofit uh, organization established in uh, 2010 as a regional strategy for addressing uh, the multifaceted and deep-rooted social and economic problem in the Niger Delta. So PIN's goal is to act as a catalyst for an enabling environment for economic uh, growth in the Niger Delta region to sustainable multi-stakeholder partnership and innovations. You know, innovation is what PIN can ignore is one of our core our values and hence this GIS because it's part of that innovation strategy. So it is a belief that uh, these events is an opportunity for our able speakers uh, drawn from uh, Nigeria and outside and participants to share knowledge as well as uh, learn on GIS for advancement of sustainable development. So I wish everybody and everyone an exciting learning and interactive session as we mark our 2021 GIS Day. So thank you so much. And what you Chukudi. Thank you very much, Dr. David, for that uh, brief welcoming and introduction. Uh, it's the privilege and an honor again to be a part of this beautiful event. For those of you who are new to what GIS is, and what uh, it's all about and the uh, opportunities that GIS offer, Chukudi Njoko will take you through the role on understanding GIS properly. Chukudi, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Deborah. So just for those who may be new to the GIS concept, and um, uh, of course, I know some persons here are already GIS experts, some persons are enthusiastic, uh, but at the same time, some persons here are new to the GIS concept and its uh, applicability. So I'm just going to, in one minute, uh, introduce uh, us to GIS, especially those group of persons. And simply, a GIS is a computer system which is capable of collecting, storing, manipulating, and displaying geographically referenced information. So the GIS system is similar to any other database system which you may be familiar with. But what makes it different and unique is the fact that it has a considered partial database. And um, that is uh, a, a data that is identified according to its location. So when you introduce partial database, that is longitude and latitude to any database, it becomes a GIS, uh, a GIS uh, data which can be used for a GIS, uh, system, in a GIS system. Now, uh, a GIS system is made up of different components uh, that make it work. There is the hardware, which can simply be the computer or your, or your phone. There are the methods that are adopted to, uh, for the process. There are people, there's the people component, which is you and I that carry out the analysis. And then there's the software, uh, such, there's a software such as um, S3 Hack GIS, or few GIS is an open source software, as well as data. Data, I think, is the uh, most important component of the GIS, as you really do anything without the data component. Also, GIS is applicable in different areas. In fact, uh, some people say GIS is applicable in a thousand areas, and that will not be totally wrong. I have, I have just listed out a few of those areas where GIS is applicable uh, for developmental purposes. Uh, it's applicable for conflict mapping and hotspot analysis. 
in agriculture and aquaculture application, disaster management, energy use tracking and planning, conflict mitigation, and peace building, like what we do in Pin Foundation with GIS, public health, wildlife management, infrastructure planning, industrial planning, and so on. So GIS is actually very useful. It's applicable in virtually every sector and every area. Uh, but today, based on the theme of this event, of our event today, we're going to be looking at how GIS has been applicable and can be applicable for conflict management and as well as for peace building uh, processes. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, we'll move on quickly to the first presenter who will be telling us about, um, about um, GIS applicability uh, on for peace building, specifically on how PINC employs GIS in decision making for programs that foster peace in communities in the Niger Delta. I will be introducing Afeno Odomovo, who is the research and conflict early warning coordinator at PIN Foundation. He is, a, he is a researcher with over eight years experience in conflict analysis, conflict early warning systems, and security studies with publications in reputable international journals, such as the military and strategic affairs and conflict trends. Afeno holds a bachelor's and an MSc in political science from the University of Ibadan. Afeno, over to you. Thank you, Jules, for that uh, brief background to uh, GRS. And uh, thank you, everyone, and welcome to this year uh, GIS Day celebration. Of course, uh, GIS uh, deserves to be celebrated, especially for its important role in the every sphere of human life, especially in the area of peace building. So I will be talking about uh, how PIN have utilized GIS technology to support uh, peace building uh, programs in Nigeria. So GIS has been applied in, uh, for peace building and have been an important role, especially in the area of uh, stakeholder analysis and uh, hotspots mapping. So for PIN, we have uh, incorporated uh, GIS technology in our peace building program, including in the area of uh, conflict early warning. Specifically, uh, PIN has leveraged the power of uh, GIS uh, technology uh, to identify among conflict hotspots and also uh, trends in the Nigeria Delta where we operate because of the complexity of uh, the environment where we operate here in Nigeria, we be leveraging on the power of GIS to identify the hotspots for targeted intervention. We also use uh, uh, the technology to determine how conflict risks are becoming evident over space and time. For example, we have used uh, the, the technology for um, conflict dynamics analysis to determine when and where to uh, intervene for more targeted and uh, impactful uh, outcome. We have also used uh, the system uh, to gather uh, geospatial data on conflict in order to be able to map uh, potential triggers of violence. And this has been an important part of the pin the the two components of peace, uh, peace building uh, system, which are the, the peace map and the SMS based conflict early warning system. Your special uh, data has been very instrumental in coordinating uh, the different components of the early warning system, especially the conflict monitors who sent to report to the uh, platform, as well as uh, coordinating and link early warning data with available uh, response actors uh, across the region. So we will leverage uh, the power of uh, GIS to identify and map conflict actors. Uh, we do this through a stakeholder uh, network analysis. So we'll be collecting uh, geographically reference uh, data so that can help us to identify and map conflict actors because we have several actors with different capability and in different area of conflict. So with the help of GIS, we're able to map uh, the different uh, stakeholders, and we're able to send uh, to link to them and the relevant information they require for targeted uh, 
intervention. Also, because we operate in a very complex uh, environment, GIS have been very, very helpful in leveraging points as well as fair of influence and uh, social capital that can be used for early warning and early response. So as I mentioned earlier, we have different uh, peace building actors, either as individuals or organizations that uh, have expertise in a different area of uh, peace building. So with the power of GIS, we're able to uh, coordinate this, uh, this wide, wide range of uh, conflict actors by linking and synchronizing conflict early warning data with available response actors. Another key uses of uh, the GIS uh, for peace, peace building program in the area of coordination. So I have used this uh, um, technology to coordinate peace building effort because we apply what we call the multi-stakeholder approach to peace building where we deal with a wide range of stakeholders from local, regional, and national levels. So with the help of a, a GIS technology, we're able to coordinate these several uh, uh, stakeholders by linking the necessary information to the appropriate stakeholder at the right time. So we do this to avoid information overload by ensuring that only the required information is disseminated to uh, stakeholders. We save them the stress of uh, information overload, and this leads to a more targeted intervention. GIS has also been very useful in the area of uh, facilitation of targeted response to emerging conflict issues in our area of operation. So we, uh, we operate in a very complex and dynamic environment. And at times we have a problem like most, uh, like every other early warning system face all over the world, an issue of linking relevant uh, early warning data to appropriate response actors. With the help of GIS technology, we are able to identify and link early warning uh, data to available response capability within the region. And this helps to uh, carry out targeted intervention by helping peace actors to identify where and where to intervene. For example, our intervention in uh, election violence mitigation relies so much on the GIS technology to determine the hotspots of election violence, as well as available actors who can help to mitigate uh, election-related violence. So PIND has leveraged the power of um, GIS technology in two key areas, and that is uh, for the PISMA, as well as the SMS uh, early warning system. The PISMA specifically uh, is uh, a geospatial based uh, data mapping platform. It's a platform that brings together multiple data and information from several sources on peace and conflict into one location. And this platform is an open source platform and it's also interactive. And this platform has sent geographical uh, features that helps users to search the database using specific and customizable parameters, which helps to visualize where and where conflict incidents are occurring. And this helps people to understand the, the, the pins and conflict uh, uh, landscape better for targeted intervention. The data also con con contain geospatial database of conflict incidents across Nigeria. And with the help of GIS, user can navigate the platform by using specific, specific geographical reference parameters to uh, pinpoint certain conflict issue to a particular location for targeted intervention. So in a way, the geographical uh, the special feature of the, 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 the system enable the users to better understand the peace and conflict landscape. And when they understand the peace and conflict landscape, they are able to mobilize appropriate uh, resources and human material resources for targeted intervention. In addition to that, the peace map using uh, geospatial data lists information on available response capacities by type and location. This capacity could be individual organization uh, that focus on certain area of peace building. So when um, a stakeholder need to collaborate, need collaboration in the area of uh, peace building, it can use the peace map to locate 
other stakeholders with related capability that can lead to collaboration. So organizations that can register on the platform can receive regular location-specific profit alert and updates. And this is possible through um, the power of GIS, which helps the system to geolocate each of the registered organization on a specific location. And this is a further step towards the linking early warning information to available response actors in the region. Specifically, PIS, I use uh, GIS to identify and locate conflict monitors. I use it for conflict early warning data collection. Also use the uh, GIS uh, system for verification and standardization of early warning data because we have uh, a, a large number of uh, conflict monitors that send reports that need uh, to verify some of this report uh, to ensure that uh, they meet uh, the qualification validity. And with the power of GIA, we're able to carry a verification. We also use this uh, the, the technology to identify response actors, not only that, and link early warning data to available response actors. And that has solved one of the greatest problems of early warning system, that is, the challenge of linking available conflict uh, reports to uh, response actors. The system has only been leveraged for the dissemination of conflict alerts and updates to response actors. So uh, we produce several complete uh, products, weekly updates, quarterly reports that are disseminated to uh, stakeholders. Some of these reports are location specific. So with the help of GIS, we're able to disseminate these reports to the specific stakeholder that requires them for targeted intervention. In addition, GIS are the very instrumental in a hotspot mapping and visualization. We've used this uh, technology to visualize the location of conflict, and this is very valuable in terms of uh, discussion and uh, intervention planning to identify area where intervention are most needed. Because uh, we are faced with the challenge of scarce resources, either just of financial or human resources, uh, we use EIS to uh, mobilize resources. For example, instead of spreading our resources everywhere, we use EIS to determine where there is an urgent need for intervention and we mobilize the appropriate human resources are those target intervention. So no doubt, uh, GIS technology is at the core of a pinned uh, peace building program, especially for the early warning and early response system. So thank you all for your attention. Over to Shukudi. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you very much, Afeno. Um, and that was uh, quite an exposition. Um, Afeno has um, told us about PIN's GIS uh, infrastructure, how we uh, use G how GIS is at the core of our peace building activity, as well as our early warning and early reporting platform. Um, PIN is using GIS in a whole lot of ways to improve its um, activities, especially peace building activities. And, um, it's interesting to know that uh, GIS is, you know, being, it, it, it's useful even in the peace building sector. Um, if you have questions for Aseno, please you can drop them in the chat box, and we would attend to your questions after the second presenter. If you have comments as well, you can also drop the comments in the chat box. Thank you very much for that presentation, Aseno. Uh, we, we we expect some. Uh, uh, engagement on your presentation as we move ahead in the, in the event. So next on the line is Professor Janine, who is joining us all the way from Glasgow. Professor Janine Ilian is the chair in statistical science at Glasgow University. Her research profile focuses on the development of modern, realistic, complex, spatial statistical method methodology that is both computational, computationally feasible, and relevant to end users. She has taken spatial processes from the theoretical literature into the real world 
and is encouraging statistical development by fostering strong relationships with the user community. Uh, Professor Jenin has carried out a couple of research work about peace building in Nigeria, uh, specifically with regards to terrorism. And uh, I'm sure she will share some of those, some of her findings and some of those insights with us um, in a few in a few moments. Professor Jenin, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'd like to hear from you now. So back thank to you. you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Um, I'll try to share my screen so that you can see my my slides. That should be it. Yeah. Is this is this visible to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great. Um, yeah. As I said, many thanks for for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my my own work, trying to link it to the, the, the general theme of um, today's meeting. And then of course, I'm happy to answer all sorts of questions afterwards um, and in the chat and in um, kind of directly in the, in the section afterwards. So um, let's see. Um, good. So what, what is what am I working on? Um, technically, I could say, well, I work on spatial and spatial temporal point process modeling, which of course is quite a mouthful and um, might sound very technical. And if you've got no experience or very little experience in this area, you might think, OK, this this is not for me. But in this talk, I'm trying to explain um, what we can do um, with the kind of models that I'm looking at, how this is linked to um, the GIS theme, um, linked to our complex modeling um, and linked to the general theme of kind of uh, learning and teaching from it. Uh, learning from each other um, and teaching each other um, across different areas of science. Um, why is this not moving? Um, so, sorry. <laughs> so in my research in general, and Chukwudi has already said this, my vision um, is to develop methodology that is practically relevant, realistically complex and accessible so that it can actually be used. Um, and the, the approach I've been using is, is to develop flexible and computationally efficient models that are motivated by strongly interdisciplinary communication and knowledge exchange. And this is basically what my talk is, is, it, is about, with a little bit more detail. Why are all these points that I highlight here important? Um, and how am, am I working on them um, with the scientific community and beyond? So. First thing to probably talk about is what, what is it I'm doing? I'm working on spatial point processes. So they are spatial models that can operate and deal with spatial data. So data potentially provided by GIS systems and um, they model patterns, spatial patterns, spatial structures um, that we observe. So they are, they are modeling locations and properties of objects or events or individuals in space and time. So we are basically reducing the information that we get from an object or an event um, to its location. And then we also attach properties to it. It could be the severity of an earthquake, the size of a tree, anything like this. And we model this in space, taking into account the spatial structure. And we want to understand the mechanisms that generate that pattern. And I've looked in my uh, my career at a number of um, very varied applications at very different spatial scales. So a very small spatial scale is what we see in this picture here. These are kind of are cancer cells, obviously very small, taken with a um, you know technology to actually um, be able to see this. Then we have, I have looked at at plants. These are rainforest trees, um, and we have also been looking at at earthquakes. What's happening here? So this is a global event. Um, or at least an event um, on the globe. And as Shukwudi has already said, um, we've also been looking at terrorist attacks. Uh, at terrorist attacks, this is a picture or a um, figure of the locations of um, global terrorist attacks that I've been working on together with a former PhD st student of mine, uh, Andre Puton, um, who had spent, spent his whole uh, PhD thesis modeling terrorism, um, in this case, global terrorism, but he's also looked at terrorism in Nigeria and speci specifically. Good, so we can model these spatial patterns. Um, we need to now look at, at challenges, at opportunities, at problems, um, and what we actually can do with these. So why are these, these important? So a lot of natural processes everywhere take place in space and time. 
And as we have seen from the previous talk, we get increasingly detailed spatial data that we actually want to understand. And these data are spatially explicit in space and time. Um, this in, the spatial structure and the spatial information that we get actually contains information. Again, we saw this in the, in the previous talk that um, we can identify hotspots, we can look at the spatial structure and use this as information and also interpret this. Um, if we average across space, then we lose information. Point processes mo look, um, uh, mo model in continuous space, so we can actually look at um, events and they are co-occurrence, so their interaction, um, repulsion or aggregation of events in space. And as you've seen, as I've already mentioned, um, applications um, that we've looked at have been in medicine, health science, ecology, environmental context, and um, with a strong focus in this talk on international relations, terrorism studies, but also geology. Most of my own personal work has been in ecology and environmental sciences. This, 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 these are areas where I have over time acquired some knowledge of not just the statistics, but also the ecology, because I've worked very strongly um, in communication with ecologists and env environmental scientists for over 20 years. Um, in other areas, I'm still learning, and um, this is one of the, the themes of my talk here as well, um, that I'll come back to later. Um, so what are the benefits of using spatial point process models? We can use GIS data and draw conclusion these, from these uh, using the models. So we can relate events um, to local conditions, which kind of loca local conditions facility, facilitate events popping up. We can predict in space. Um, so which local conditions make an event more likely? And as I said, we can do this in con continuous space. We con can do this as a, on a small spatial scale, but also on a large spatial scale. So on the whole globe, as we have seen, actually modeling directly on the sphere without projecting into two-dimensional space if we want to. Here's some work, for example, that my PhD student, um, former PhD student that I mentioned earlier, Audrey, um, has done. Um, and he looked at the frequency, severity, and lethality of um, terrorism and could relate these two different local um, conditions, the population, travel time to the nearest city, satellite night, uh, satellite night, night lights, sorry, and um, similar covariates. And of course, this is where a, a strong point that I want to um, make um, comes in, which are actually the local conditions of interests. And when um, André worked on his terrorism work in his, during his PhD, he, of course, spent a lot of time learning the statistical techniques, applying them, but also he spent a lot of time um, identifying the appropriate um, factors uh, and covariates, as we would say, that might be relevant in this context. So there's a lot of um, communication necessary. And um, just a little point about the challenges. I haven't really talked about the technical background to point processes because they are actually mathematically very complex. On, the, uh, on one hand, that's intriguing for mathematicians, interesting work to do, but they are also computationally very expensive. There are dependent structures and spatial models, and these need to be modeled alongside the, the um, structures of interest, and that makes them computationally expensive. That's why it's important to develop methods that are um, computationally um, flexible and fast and efficient so that we can actually use these models in practice. Otherwise, it would be too impossible or um, not feasible to use them. So as a result, um, the theoretical literature in the past has mainly looked at you know, looked at theoretical thinking, looked at very small patterns in very small observation points or windows, assuming that everything has been observed and detected. In reality, this, this is not the case. So my work over the last 20 years or so has been to kind of change this, to actually um, remove these assumptions and make things more um, realistic so that we can actually answer questions, scientific questions and practical questions. So um, that's what I'm saying here. So I have made a methodology, I try to make the methodology practically relevant, realistically complex and accessible using the flexibility, the efficiency and interdisciplinary communication. 
I've said this before, this is a kind of short version of a previous slide, but I just wanted to highlight that um, these are the, the important points that I've tried to summarize through this talk. So we have developed a computation efficient models, um, but we still need to work on this. These models are there, but it's not the case that everybody is using them. So we need to, one of my missions in a way is to kind of speak to people who might want to use the methodology um, to learn from them. Um, so what kind of models do we, are actually the right models to build in terms of the factors that come, get, uh, come into them, um, but also to teach. And um, this is you know, one of the reasons I'm speaking here, I think, is to kind of explain that the methodology is there so that people can use them. It. So way forward um, beyond this talk is um, kind of speaking to people. So having um, communication. Um, across boundaries interdiscipline, in, in interdisciplinary ways. I have a lot to learn. I know a little bit about terrorism modeling through the work that I've been doing with my PhD student, but there are so many other applications, again, something we've seen in the previous talk and will likely see during this, this session here, um, multiple and both ways we need to com communicate, we need to teach each other, and we need to learn from, from each other. And um, this is the, the, I think the, the approach um, in very few words is to actually have a strong and bilateral or multilateral communication going on to learn from each other, both the methodology, but also the, the relevance and in the end, the interpretation of the, the output from models. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Janine Ilian, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, like she rightly said, she has uh, been able to partially uh, pick out data and uh, their modeling patterns, as well as uh, help people understand, you know, how these trends are generated, as well as uh, how to deal with these patterns. Like she rightly said, patterns like cancer cells, plant and animals, as well as terrorist attacks, as you know, attributed to one of her work she has done uh, previously. She equally stated the relevance of using these uh, spatial point processes, which is, of course, she said, to draw a conclusion to models and then to answer scientific questions of which uh, she shed light on. So thank you very much, Professor Jenny, for that uh, beautiful, beautiful presentation. Thank you. The next, you are welcome. Many thanks. The next on our list, we have uh, Caroline Accord. Caroline Accord. Caroline Accord is a, a special data scientist and co-founder of Women in GIS Kenya. She has vast experience in the geospatial field, as well as supported uh, the application of data in effective decision making in various industries, such as health and urban planning. Most recently, Caroline has supported the United Nations Human Settlement Process in achieving the SDG 11, uh, as well as uh, cities and human settlements, inclusive, uh, safe and re resilient, as well as sustainable processes. She has also uh, assisted the GIS Kenya to ensure that uh, the organization accomplishes its mandate to continue to use data to champion for gender equality. Caroline Accord, over to you. Welcome on board. Um, thank you very much for having me today. I'm going to be talking about enhancing this building through GIS, but approaching this with the angle of women, gender, and peace building. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, please, we can, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, um, so to start us off, I want us to look at a couple of definitions that I'm going to be focusing on. So I want us to understand gender, peace build, uh, gender and peace building, data feminism, and also gender data. So my understanding of, gen of, of gender or what um, this presentation is going to be focusing on by working for gender is the economic, social, political, and cultural attributes associated with being male, female, or the other gender. And then the understanding of gender and peace building is the exploration of how gender and peace building interface. Uh, both conceptually and physically, and then um, how how addressing this will address uh, deep rooted in, in inequities, and this includes gender-based inequalities that are current in the society. 
And then another concept that I'd like to look into is data feminism. So this is the way of thinking about data uh, that is directly influenced by experience uh, with a commitment to action and then looking at this at the intersection of uh, uh, feminism. So basically uh, splitting up data and introducing attributes of data, uh, introducing attributes of gender into the understanding of data. And then finally, gender data. So this is data, this is generally all the data, but just dis are disaggregated by sex, uh, looking at reflecting gender issues and then including roles, uh, relationships and inequalities. So this gender data can be both qualitative and quantitative, and again, can also be both spatial and unspatial because we're looking at, um, again, GIS data. Okay. Um, so why I think the gender data is important in, 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 uh, in peace building and how we can incorporate G uh, gender data into GIS and peace building. Um, so gender data is powerful in uncovering gender inequality. Um, also, it's very important in illuminating solutions because uh, if we are looking at, say, the impacts of a conflict in a community, and we are not splitting this impact into how this uh, how this conflict impact impacted men, how this conflict impacted women, and how this conflict is uh, is impacting or has impacted the the other gender, um, then we are not going to be having targeted solutions. Um, and then the other aspect of why gender data is powerful is uh, helping us trying to look at or monitor or or, mon or monitoring progress. So we are not just monitoring progress at um, general perspective but we're looking at this progress from how this progress is, is affecting or how these uh, mitigation measures that have been implemented are supporting women, supporting men, supporting the other gender. And then uh, more and better gender data leads to policies that are equitable, effective, and unique to the, to, to the responsiveness of community. So this is just an angle that I, want us, uh, I wanted us to introduce in our discussion around the application of GIS and peace building. So just understanding that GIS data is whatever kind of data that we're working with, we are actively trying to split it into the different aspects of gender. And uh, this way we are understanding and uncovering uh, different inequalities. Um, so while I was preparing for this, I, I looked into the alignment of gender references in different data standards or what uh, the different communities and different sectors are looking at. Um, luckily to date, as reported by the data to X, uh, which gets sources from the SDG5. Uh, so this looks at how gender data, has, uh, gender data has been adopted by the different industries. So you see for economic justice and rights, about 7% at achievement. Uh, for feminist action, for climate justice, about 41%, which is doing really well. And then for technology and, and innovation for gender equality, gender data has, uh, gender data has been um, actively uptaken but what's significantly missing is looking at gender data and in our responses for peace building and conflict resolution so trying to understand uh, the impact the, the mitigation measures that are being put in place uh, the, the the programs that are being adopted um, significantly gender data is missing in this in this sector or in our sector uh, which i think is something that is crucial um, in the adoption of gis for peace building um, there's different uh, there's different areas in which gender references is being aligned for data standards, and there's different organizations uh, like the government organizations, donors, and civil societies, and what they are doing um, uh, to increase the uptake of gender data. Um, so this boils down to people who are actively in the field collecting data. So this means uh, uh, this means it can be down to distributing surveys that are already gendered. Uh, so by gender, I mean just identifying how many responses we have from men, how many responses we have from women, and having specific questions for uh, for both as well. Um, and then there's organizations that are going into funding because we cannot collect data if we are not being funded to collect data. Um, and then the use of gender data for policy making. Um, until very recently, gender data was not being adopted for policy making. So we'd make uh, what do I call them? Umbrella, umbrella policies to cover both men, women, and the other and the and the other gender, and not specifically looking at how these policies are the other gender. Um, 
yeah so these are just um highlighting the references where peace building and conflict and uh, conflict resolution has been missing um in identifying and using gendered data so why i think gender uh, gender analysis in peace and conflict resolution is important there's many peace building activities and policies that are gender blind so this means uh, we will see a lot of activities or a lot of uh projects around hot spotting conflict or hot spotting peace building activities but we're not looking at out of this red zone or out of this green zone um how many men are being affected and how are they being affected or how many women are being affected and how are they being affected and then gender analysis can also bring to light the experiences of both men women uh, of both men and women during the conflict after the uh, or in post and after the conflict and then assess the needs of these two genders separately so how this uh gender related to change uh during the conflict and again after the conflict and then the use of analytical tools sorry there's a mess in my background and then the use of analytical tools uh when taking the gender approach to this building could lead to gender equality and peace so again i'm trying uh, uh, what i'm what i'm trying to focus on here is sort of, sort of trying to achieve to to kill two birds with one stone so looking at dimensions of gender equality and how this can be achieved uh through peace building and through conflict resolution so this is just looking at how different how different genders respond to different mitigation measures that have been put in place and how this uh by essence will lead to an establishment of gender equality and then by extension will lead to peace in different communities um so i have a couple of case studies where gender and peace building have been put together to to support for or to speak for the application of data and the application of specifically gis data in peace building so like in this case study uh, done by the government also of, of South Africa, the South, the, the, South, the South Metropolitan Local Council of South Africa. So they looked at prevention of sexual violence during conflict. Uh, so this means they had collected a lot of spatial data on areas, areas that are prone to conflicts. Uh, what routes are being used to, to accelerate this conflict and how different uh, gender dimensions, uh, dimensions are being applied. Uh, the other project that put this into practice was the campaign uh the campaign for action uh the, the action campaign for peace sorry so this looked at um this happened this happened in kenya um in the northern in the, in the northern part of kenya where we see a lot of community or tribal attacks and these are fueled by uh by economies uh this is fueled by lack of access to to finances. So this means that there's going to be different communities fighting with each other to get cattle. Uh, so this project looks at promoting, uh, promoting economic development and it addressed the collection of data uh, for both men with access to this kind of, uh, uh, of economic variables, women with access to this kind of economic variables and so on. Uh, I've, I've, I've highlighted this as case studies for projects that are uh, projects that incorporated gender into their peace peace building objective because they incorporated the use of spatial data, non-spatial data, and gender. And in my opinion, these were really successful uh, projects. Um, so, if, if, if you're wondering what data points uh, would be important in working with gender data and how this can be made spatial data. Uh, so these are some of the points that have come up with so like social economic variables this is uh this can be both collected as spatial data or non-spatial data and then the inclusion of gender analysis in politics so how many women are in politics uh how many have bored and how the constituents are uptaking this um and then we also have information or data on survivorship and re-victimization so this generally splits up uh, who the survivors are, where the survivors are located, and the programs that they have been put into. And then the other thing, uh, the other thing to look at is the assimilation and uh, into reintegration programs. Uh, so this is generally post conflict and what happens um, then. So all these all these points can be grouped into four thematic areas. So this would be access to justice, economic dimensions, intergenerational tension and conflicts, and then permutation and continuums of violence. Um, yeah.
the points are not exhaustive or rather the yeah the data points are not exhaustive of of of, of, of how of how we can include gender into our analysis um for peace building these points are not exhaustive they're just points that are picked as examples of where uh gender data can be used um yeah i've also highlighted a couple of resources um that i came across while preparing for this so these are resources that would have information about gender data and how it can be applied in peace building um again gender data would be both spatial data and non-spatial data in our in our discussion in our js discussion sorry yeah thank you very much that would be it for me Thank you very much, Carol. That was a very insightful presentation. And it's actually very interesting to see how um, you have integrated GIS and gender. Um, of course, we, we know that GIS is relevant in a lot of fields, but um, applying it to gender is another very interesting and useful angle, which uh, one may not really think about. Um, it's interesting to see how um, you have emphasized uh, 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 how, how, how you're able to collect and disaggregate gender, gender data. And uh, I find that interesting because also in PIN here, we, we, we mainstream gender and uh, we make sure that in our programs, we collect data with regards to gender and, of course, disability as well. You have emphasized how gender data is powerful and how better gender data leads to policies that are equitable and effective and um, uh, uh, specifically for responsive and unique needs of people. Uh, those are quite insightful. Uh, I'm sure we'll have one or two feedback from the audience and uh, we'll be happy if you can attend to them. We do have some questions already and um, we have some questions, some hands are raised. Uh, we'll attend to some questions now before we have the last presentation. But I'm just going to take some questions from the chat box before um, we we have uh, uh, responses from the people who have their hands raised. I can see that um, Bart asked a question which uh, Prof has answered. Um, Bart says there's a branch of AI called computer vision. Computer vision deals with the image processing and pattern recognition. And he wanted Prof to explain if there is any if there is any uh, if is this any way synonymous with special point processes. And uh, Prof. Prof. Jenin has responded to that. He said, this is an answer to, uh, okay, there's a difference. Pattern recognition methods find or detect patterns in space, while post process models are statistical models that explain the special patterns relative to local conditions. Yeah, so these are some very technical, technical uh, GIS jargon. And, uh, I'm happy to see that uh, there's some engagement around, around, uh, around that. Okay, we'll have some other questions here. Okay. You have some questions? Okay, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me clearly now? Yes, yes. All right, this question, this question goes to Professor Jenin. Once again, sorry for that glitch. And the question is from Marise who says, how best can GIS enable easy sharing of data and collaboration between experts from different locations working on a common project? Professor Jenin, please, that question is for you. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question, actually, because um, not only do we need to talk to each other and exchange ideas, but we also need to exchange data. And of course, G GIS methodology gives us a platform that can be used everywhere because it's a, a very general form, format. So 
rather than you know everyone having their own little software that has been developed locally it's a global software using very similar um approaches everywhere so you know data sets have specific formats that can be moved across and shared um obviously if they can be shared uh, for legal reasons to um, between different communities so um that's that's actually a really important point as well that um if we use the same data format and that there's a kind of general agreement on data formats um formats we can share them much more easily and work together on them i hope that answers answers the question <laughs> Yes, I, I think you have. Um, I think you have a question. Can you just respond to that, please? Thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you, Shibudi. So our uh, question for Bartolome. The question says that what are the challenges faced uh, in executing PIN's objectives? I assume it's referring to uh, PIN data collection objectives, and if that is right, so one of the challenges we face is that of uh, lack of your spatially referenced uh, data are collected from community level because our early warning system is a community-based system that collects early warning data from community level. And most of the data are not geographically referenced. So I can solve this problem by formatting this data and including uh, geographical information the data to make that to be geographically referenced. The second challenge is that of uh, lack of awareness. So, and this program is part of the strategy to create awareness among these partner stakeholders uh, on um, your spatial data collection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Afeno, for that response. There's another question here from Arinze Uzoize. Uh, this question is for uh, Caroline. Yeah. It's asking, how can how can one how can one develop global synergy to inspire girls and women, particularly in Africa, to embrace GIS and bring with the gender gap in GIS sector? Caroline, a question for you. Um, how can how can one do what? Sorry. How can one develop global synergy to inspire girls and women, particularly in Africa, to embrace GIS? and bridge the gender gap in the GIS sector. Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, so in my experience, what has been working is uh, the, the, incorporation of, the incorporation of gender data for different projects. So specifically looking at uh, in different application areas. So if, if, if you're looking at application, application of this data in, in peace building, or if you're looking at application of this data in, like say infrastructure analytics, so specifically looking at how this will affect women, how this will affect girls, um, how the how the development and the use of this data would econ economically empower girls and women in this case. Uh, uh, just 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 generally advocating for and being at the forefront of presenting other women and girls who are in the same industry and are succeeding in using this data um yeah and this has uh this has seemed to work over a couple of years over the past couple of years all right thank you very much Kara, for that uh answer thank you very much there is a question here for afeno from dorothy a research associate joining us from nairobi kenya and she says i would like to know how real time is the data collection done for the P4P PSMAP platform? Thank you. This is for Afeno Super. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Dorothy, for your question. Um, the question is how real time data collection is done for the P4P PSMAP? Okay, so we have two data collection platforms again. One collect real time data, the other one is data aggregation platform. So the PISMA is a data aggregation platform that aggregates data on conflict from several sources and make the data available to users on a single platform to help them to triangulate and cross-check uh, those uh, information. The real-time data is collected for, for P4P using an SMS-based early warning system. And the data is collected in real-time by training feed monitors. 
This monitors that train at the community level on how to observe and identify conflict issues and report a real time to the platform. And this data as well uh, disseminated to response actors as soon as they are received on the platform. So to answer your question, real-time data for P4P are collected using an SMS-based early warning system that enables the field monitor to send conflict incident report in real time to the platform. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Arsenio. So just before we take the last speaker, uh, Joshua is on standby. Uh, we're going to have Ruth Omo Kumilola um, ask a question or uh, tell us a comment. Um, Ruth, you have been promoted to speak, so you can unmute yourself and let us hear you. Thank you. Okay, Ruth is not there. Cecilia Okoro, do you have something to say? Your hands are raised. Okay, so we can move on quickly. Um, now we are going to take the last presenter, um, which is Joshua Okeke. Joshua will be, Joshua's presentation centers on how he has supported his organization to employ GIS in decision making for programs that foster peace in communities. Okay, so. Joshua Okeke is a seasoned GIS professional, and in fact, one of the foremost in the field of GIS in Nigeria. He has a tech diploma in GIS and several GIS certifications. He was head technical support at Sambot Geospatial Nigeria and had passed and, and was and was past GIS and data manager at Tom Tom McCarthy and innovative market-driven program funded by the United Kingdom Foreign. Commonwealth and Development Office, the SDO, and managed by Palladium International Development Nigeria. Joshua is also the co founder of Geospatial Nigeria Forum and the founder of Spatial and Data Science Society of Nigeria. Joshua, thank you very much for raising this occasion. You have the floor now. Thank you. Thank you. Good everyone, and um, happy GIS Day to you all. It's great to have everyone here, and um, we are going to share how GIS has been supportive in helping us achieve some of their mandate in our project, which is a project that is about making the market work for the poor and for rural, small scale and poor rural household uh, farmers. We all know when it comes to peace, you know, um, rural household or poor farmers are, they are like big in terms of the pyramid. They are very important to peace. And when all is well with peace, all is well with all those households, I think the society, the community and the rest of that will also experience and the um, peace. So I will want to share the strategy I want to share, which is just for right in three, which is what I'm understanding. It's very important for us to understand based on the intervention of the the market strategy. Second plan, we plan based on the software data requirements and the rest of that. And the last one is ask. We have to collect everything that has to do with the project. From measurement, system maps, anyone and the rest of that. So these are the strategies that are um, basically this is a summary of how we are applying them, which is also follows the principle of the terms of the data collection of all these data sources, data process, and data results. So we combine different results. Use different data from different sources. Some of them are open source, and most, most of them are open source, and we process them and also extract them 
desired results from them. Now, how did we apply all this? Or where, which area did it, was it important to us? First, access to clean energy. So we applied GIS and most effective to justify the intervention using Moses and MDS. It helps us with no areas that there is a lot of uh, greenhouse gas and climate change in the north of Cameron and And also in the area of agroforestry, and the very areas of the economic trees, we were able to identify places that are for economic trees. Such as Goma Rabbit and the rest of Then access to finance as the basis of an update, livestock, as we able to for livestock. Like this aggregation uh, and offset, we're able to know, okay, when farmers have best, where is the nearest market they take it to? Where do you meet the offset as an aggregator? I have discovered that some of these roads they use, is, some of them are flooded. Some of them have security challenges. So these are some of those things we're able to do for offset canalization. Then livestock, then uh, irrigation. In fact, for the irrigation intervention using GIS, we are to go to the areas for irrigation. It saves a lot of pounds, millions of pounds. Because before now, what they do is they have to send a irrigation of people to the people and look for to check. But using GIS, we did a modern and we came up with suitable area or suitable area or viable area for irrigation um, intervention in the northeast. And uh, the other, that was it. And it saves the cost of man, man hours, time, and financial cost. Then, mechanization. We're able to um, enable GPS track, uh, track, track using personal developed factors on almost of the factors that were working, that were really starting on. And those factors give feedback on. This is the work, the time they spent working, and the rest of that. Same using GM, then poultry and animal. Now, my school, we have almost um, about 150 computer research. Web maps like that, school, and one concept which federal government also um, adopted. Then, prospect cost marking, new destination, cost assessment, and cost health. We dated last week, community assessment for this uh, erosion and education and education. And some of the challenges, variety of volume, volume and velocity of data, redundancy, um, portability and scalability, and so we are applying in other states. That's the easy because we see it. And you have sharing to patient standards and accessibility. So these are some of the challenges. Then, I mean, I want to, I will run through some of the map things. These are activities in the Northeast and places to um, work, to, to come and work. And this is an example of these are land use land or the local government to do this. This was a model we used. And this is uh, using the um, remote sensing data to actually to the case that um, North Sea or the Sahel Savannah is actually being affected by the issue and climate change. And you can see it's been uh, This is an audit assessment of the target. This helps us actually 
for that uh, wonderful presentation. That was insightful indeed. Uh, like you rightly stated, uh, your strategy and methods to data collection and how you were able to apply it. Of course, you rightly mentioned you were able to access, you applied it to access uh, clean energy, agroforestry, as well as access to finance and aggregation and offtakes. So most of uh, what Joshua said were this, except Chokodi, do you have something to add to what Joshua had earlier said? Uh, not much really, not to repeat what um, Joshua has said, but uh, it's very interesting to see, you know, how Joshua has been able to apply CIS for his work. Um, and of course, we, I think, can relate to some of the activities like access to clean energy, um, access to finance, aggregation, and uptake. Uh, and the like. So it's interesting to see how GIS is being applied in these different sectors. I must say, uh, thank you very much, Joshua, for um, exposing us to this application and for celebrating today's event with us. Um, thank you. Okay, so we we have one or two hands raised. Um, Joshua, your hand has been up. Uh, I, I suppose you have a question. Are you ready to ask your question now? Yes, yes Joshua, you can unmute yourself if you have a question or a comment. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, Joshua's presentation brings us to the end of today's event. I'm sure uh, some, I'm sure we all have um, learned or gained one or two new things from uh, today's GIS Day event and GIS Day celebration. We want to thank everyone who was part of today's GIS Day event, from the speakers um, who invested your time to share knowledge, and from the participants who found it worthy to grace today's event. We hope that we've been able to expose you to the application of spatial technology to conflict prevention and peace building. Okay, yes, before I go ahead, there's a, an important comment here. And um, please would love if the presenters can share their slides, uh, share the slides with me afterwards. We have your email as a participant. We're going to share it with you afterwards. So, um, Caroline, Josh, and the professor. Yeah, so please, if you can share your slides with me after the event, and I will make sure I get to the participants. Yes, thank you. So we hope that we've been able to expose everyone here today to the application of special technology to complete prevention and peace building, and in fact, to other aspects like um, Joshua has highlighted. We enjoin you to continue to live peacefully while being peace access, while the access of peace in your local community. Uh, you can. 
find out more about our work and how you can collaborate with us at PIN Foundation, our website is www.pinfoundation.org. And if you reside in the Niger Delta, you can also volunteer to be a PIN monitor by sending an SMS to 080-9936-2222. I can take that again, 080-9936-2222. Yes. Um, also, you can join our Partners for Peace Network. You can simply visit the website www.p4p-nizerdelta.org. Deborah? Thank you very much, Chuck, for uh, running off. Uh, do not forget the number once again to call is 08099 Send your messages across. Do not forget that this uh, the GIS Day was commemorated uh, by the peace building of the foundation with the theme enhancing peace building through GIS as our own contribution to bringing positive peace to the Niger Delta and across board. Thank you very much all for being a part of this event. Thank you.